evening, darlings. I hope you're all having a fabulous Halloween week, getting up to all kinds of creepy and spooky shenanigans. I'm hosting a very special Halloween dinner tonight. I'm being joined by some very dear friends, including an old high school buddy of mine, Michael Myers. Oh, such a wonderful man. He's had a tough life, but he always walks around with this hilarious mask on his face. Such a good sense of humor. And he's so handy when it comes to dinner parties. He always brings a nice sharp cooking knife for me to use. Although it's always covered with human blood, still, it makes the food taste even richer. Now, on to our first Halloween special story. Imagine you lived right out in the sticks and saw something very strange crouching by your car. I was living with a friend at the time, as I had nowhere to really go, and I was saving up for an apartment of my own due to reasons irrelevant to the story, and my girlfriend typically stayed the night with me, as we had an entire basement bedroom to ourselves, and he didn't really mind, as we were all close, and still are to this day. I was a pretty heavy smoker at the time, and went outside to take my habit away from the house, to which my girlfriend would follow to partake as well. So, like any other time that my nicotine craving set in, I would grab my lighter from the bedside table and go to head out into his driveway. My friend lived out in the country, surrounded by forests, country roads and several farms. He had a pretty sizeable yard in front of the road, which led into some dense trees, and the only place really open around those parts was a gas station you could walk down to in about five minutes. Anything else was a good 15-20 minutes away. Anyway, as I head outside, my girlfriend behind me, her and I are having a pretty light-hearted conversation, inside jokes and whatnot, before something catches my eye near my vehicle, which was parked under the old oak tree near the centre of his yard in the driveway. I'm sure everyone knows the feeling of trying to focus on something that you feel isn't supposed to be there, so you tune everything out around you. Well, that's what was going on. Besides my car, there was something crouched down, akin to how a cat or dog would sit. It was about 11pm, so it was dark, and the porch light wasn't reaching far enough to get it, but this is what I could make out. It had long arms that, despite being in front of it, the elbows pointed back behind it. There was no visible hair that I could see, and it had a large bulbous head and looked to have what I'm guessing could be pointed ears, judging from the silhouette of the thing. I'm not entirely sure about the size as I was still a distance away and it was crouched down beside my vehicle, but it looked like if it stood up, it could be about my height and I'm 6'1". As soon as I started to piece together what I was staring at, I realised my girlfriend had begun questioning me, calling out my name and walking to my side. Instinctively, I blocked her way with my arm and told her to get back inside as I continued staring at this thing, which made no effort to turn and look at us and remained unmoving. She gave a sort of laugh, assuming I was messing with her, which isn't unlike me. Then she began trying to look at what I was focused on. She catches sight of it, and I remember her asking me, what is that? I had no idea how to answer her, but this confirmed that what I was seeing was entirely real. In a panic, we both started backing towards the door, still garnering no reaction from the thing at my car until we were at the door, fumbling for the knob and then finally getting inside. After we're inside, she asks again what it is. I still had no idea. After we head back down to the basement, she decides to sketch what she'd seen so I can get a look at it and that we can line up exactly what she saw. A few minutes later, I'm looking at it again on paper. A bulbous head, long arms with the elbows arched behind it, crouched down and pointed protrusions we are both assuming were ears. An ex of mine used to have get-togethers during high school where we'd drink and do what typical junior and seniors our age did. Where I wound up staying where I saw this thing 
is about 15 minutes from there, give or take. It's back road heavy, so most of it is woods and the like. After her and I broke up, I stopped going as you'd expect. One of the nights, my friend called me around 11. He had chosen to crash on the couch and he was new to the area. Apparently, when he and my ex had gone outside to smoke, they heard a loud cry of sorts that made them run back inside. I've lived in areas with mountain lions and coyotes, so so I was called to ask if there was any animal I know that could, as they put it, wail. All that came to mind was really a mountain lion. So they looked it up and said it sounded nothing like that. Obviously, I, I wasn't there to witness it, and this was a few years before my encounter. But thinking about it now, it is odd how close the area is. As far as the thing I saw goes, something that stood out to me is that I don't know if it was crouching or hiding. My girlfriend and I talk about it from time to time. But one question that always comes up is why at my car that I parked under an old tree? I went there to grab my cigarettes from the glove box multiple times a night as I smoked half a pack a day, maybe more before I kicked the habit. I doubt it was waiting on me or anything, but it's just such a strange place to see anything really when there's a massive front yard right in front of it. Ever since I've moved out, I've only been back to house sit for the occasions he's on vacation. I only stay long enough to tend to his cats, food, water and litter. Any longer than that and I'm practically sprinting out the door with my girlfriend in tow. We've both decided the whole area is just wrong in a way that you feel when you're sneaking around in a no trespassing area. I never told this story to anyone until now. I stay in an area of North Carolina that back in the early 1800s had the biggest sawmill in the United States at the time. The town of Elizabethtown now sits on the grounds of that sawmill. To the north is Bladen Lake State Forest. There's a creek there called Turnbull Creek, named after the Indian chief that laid claim to the land there. My grandfather told me Chief Turnbull struck a deal with the sawmill and allowed them to cut the trees except in one area where many of their ancestors were laid to rest. The story goes that the loggers began cutting and for years no problem had ever come between the loggers and the tribe until the day they cut on sacred land. A battle broke out, and in the end, the tribe was slaughtered, all except the chief. It was said he cursed the land and swore to protect it forever. It was said he changed into smoke as dark as coal, and inside it was two bright red eyes like fire. A story that, when told in detail, would scare any kid from venturing off into the woods, except me and my then best friend. In my younger years, I loved to explore, so naturally those woods made a great place to have adventures and discovery. The creek always gave me relief from those hot summer days. The cool water fed by springs that was so cold that in the heat it would give you goosebumps. I used to think there was gold in the water for all the glittery flakes you would find all over your skin after a dip in the tea-colored waters. You always had to be careful of where you took a swim because of cottonmouths, water moccasins, and rattlesnakes. They also enjoyed the banks. The forest around it was loaded with wildlife. Deer, black bear, raccoons, and squirrels could be seen around on a daily basis. Sometimes, if you were lucky, you would find an arrowhead or a railroad spike from the old logging rail that went down on the side of the creek. The old dirt road to the creek was a good hour's walk from the neighborhood. I remember one spot on that road was always cold, even in the summer. So cold, in fact, we would run as fast as we could to get through it. Sometimes it felt like the temperature would drop from 99 to 50 degrees right there. Eventually, I got curious as to why. Maybe it was another creek that nobody knew about, or a pond filled with fish, or maybe something like that. Whatever it was, I was going to find out. One June day, me and my best friend set out to find out. My grandfather told us not to and told me the story of Chief Turnbull. I wrote it off as an old tale to scare kids and set off for the woods anyway. I never believed ghost stories, so this one wasn't going to scare me either. I told my best friend to be prepared for him to try to scare us, and off we went. 
I remember walking forever through those woods and never finding anything, so we decided to follow the cold air and see where it went. After some time passed, we came upon a thick area in the woods. Thorny vines and thick underbrush was everywhere. The cold air was coming from the inside of this thicket. We found what we thought was a deer trail and crawling on our hands and knees we made our way through. It felt like 100 feet we crawled before everything cleared. No trees, no brush, just tall grass and mounds of dirt scattered about and the air was freezing cold. The whole clearing was surrounded by the thicket like a ring. The air was misty like a light morning fog. In the middle of the clearing was what looked like smoke from a campfire. It was a dark smoke, and in it was what looked like a person standing there. All I could see is the outline of a body, but when it turned around, I saw the eyes. Bright red like fire. It moved toward us quicker than we could react. When we did react, we moved like lightning and it struck us on the feet. I never knew a person could run on all fours, but we did that day, right back through that thicket so fast it seemed like a flash. Behind us, we could hear something stomping through the woods like a charging bear and people whispering in our ears. We made it out of the thicket and never stopped running. We ran until the air warmed up and we couldn't breathe enough air in. I think it stopped chasing us long before we stopped because we didn't hear it anymore. But why not be a little safe and make sure? When we made it out of the woods, it was starting to get dark. No words were spoken on that walk home, just two kids trying to make sense of what happened in our heads. We walked by his house first, then mine was a block away. I had to walk past my grandfather's house to get home. He was sitting on the front porch when I walked by. He asked me if I had found what we were looking for, and I told him yes. He asked if I wanted to show him with a smile, in which I replied, hell no. The next day, I went back to my grandfather's house. He told me how he did the same thing when he was little, how he saw the clearing and the mounds, and he said it chased him out of there too. Them woods hide many dark secrets, and that was just one of them. I remember him saying, my best friend and I drifted apart after that. He never spoke to me about it, and I never spoke about it to him. He's now the chief of police in a town close by, and I work for an engineering firm building roads and bridges. My stepson came to me not long ago and asked if we could ride that road one night and spotlight deer. I told him, go if you want to, but I wouldn't. Them woods hide many dark secrets, some you don't want to discover. Sometimes I ride by that dirt road. Sometimes I will look down it. Sometimes I see a smoky figure standing there with glowing red eyes looking back at me. When I do, I know Chief Turnbull is still there, and he's still protecting the sacred lands. He won't have to protect them from me, though. I'll never go back. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the scariest thing that ever happened to me. It happened last year between Christmas and New Year's Eve. I'm from the French Caribbean, so it's not unusual to scuba dive during Christmas holidays. My family and I booked a few dives. They're all really good scuba divers, better than me. They passed a few scuba diving levels that allow them to participate in way more technical dives than I'm allowed to do. I enjoy scuba diving as well, and I'm able to do almost every casual dive, but I don't feel safe diving without an instructor yet. Even more if it's a dive with decompression stops required. If anyone isn't familiar with scuba diving, here's a quick explanation. You can dive safely until a certain depth before the pressure becomes dangerous. If you dive below that point, which is roughly 20 meters or 65 feet, you have to do decompression stops during your ascent. It means that you have to stop while going back up to the surface for a certain time to let your body adapt to the pressure. If you ride up too quickly, you may catch decompression sickness, which can lead, in a worst case scenario, to death. So we decided that I could manage a little private lesson with an instructor first, prior to more exciting dives with my family. So the first day, my family was enjoying a dive on a technical spot that I wasn't feeling up to while I was alone with my instructor and retrieving my old scuba diving reflexes. 
Everything went okay. We were on a beautiful coral reef. There were many beginners on the boat and I was by far the most experienced here. So finally, my instructor decided that he could manage me with another student who was truly a beginner. And after a small briefing with every safety rule and hand sign, which is the only way to communicate underwater, we began our descent. I quickly retrieved all my old reflexes and was enjoying myself going back and forth to the instructor and the beginner diver during at least 20 minutes. Everything was perfect besides one thing. It was a windy day and there was a heavy swell. It's less of a problem underwater, that is for surface swimmers. The only thing was that it requires more physical effort to swim and so my air bottle was emptying a little quicker than usual, which is normal. I signed to my instructor that I was running thin of air and he nodded. At this stage, it was far from being critical. It was at this moment that I saw a young man swimming towards me. It wasn't the instructor, nor a student. I've never seen him before, and he was in full scuba diving gear, and we were the only dive boat on the spot, so I assumed he was with us, and I just didn't pay any attention to him on the boat. He was swimming fast towards me, and then signed to me he was out of air. When an air failure happens in scuba diving, there is a very strict procedure. You have to help the person, no questions asked, because every second is vital. If you faint underwater, you drown. On your gear, you have two breathing devices, regulator and octopus, a main device and a spare device. So I handed the guy my spare breathing device, which means that we both were breathing on my gear, consuming twice as much air as I was consuming alone. I waited till the guy seemed to calm down and tried to hand sign to him to go and see my instructor. He shook his head as a no and signed me to start our ascent. I understand this is the main procedure. I was a little low on air and above the decompression stop level, so the right thing to do was to go up to the surface before having an air failure, but I had to tell my instructor first. The guy was very reluctant and it was strange because it would have taken us 30 seconds to tell the instructor and he would have started an ascent with us. During this time, I was panicking, seeing my own air level going down, and I saw that our instructor was staring at us quizzically and swimming towards us. At this moment, the guy let go of my spare air device and started swimming away, breathing again in his own breathing device. I was totally lost and started my ascent with my instructor. Once at the surface, because of the tides, I was feeling dizzy and nauseous, so my bizarre encounter wasn't the first thing that I debriefed. It was after I calmed down and the boat started driving us towards the beach, without the strange guy, that I asked my instructor about what happened. Oh, I don't know, they said. Maybe a guy who lost his group and needed some time to calm down. I replied, okay, but why did he tell me that he was out of air? My instructor told me that I probably misunderstood his hand signing, but he was probably not telling me he was having an air failure because he left breathing in his own device. I'm sure I saw him do the air failure sign, but okay. The next day I joined my family during my dive and the instructor was different. It was a girl this time, Charlie. I had time to think about that guy and I was worried about him. So I told everything that happened to Charlie and asked her if she knew the guy and if he was okay because I didn't see him going back to the surface. She asked me to describe him, which I did, and she told me, oh, that's Marvin. No, don't worry about him. He's preparing himself to become a scuba diving instructor. Every time he has a day off from the restaurant he's working in, he asks us to drive him to the coral reef that morning and to pick him up in the afternoon. I ate at his restaurant this noon and saw him, don't worry. I was feeling relieved and told myself that it was just a comprehension issue with Marvin. The rest of the week went without any incident. I was doing more and more technical dives and everything went very smoothly. Charlie was a wonderful instructor. I never saw Marvin again. That is, until the last dive. It was New Year's Eve. We planned the best dive on that day. It was a shipwreck and I felt trained enough to try it without any instructor, just my family and I. It was Charlie's day off. It was fairly deep for a beginner like me, 30 meters down at that point, around 98 feet. My first day male instructor was there and told us he would be exploring the shipwreck too, so we would cross him and he would help me if he felt that I needed it. It was very comforting to know that. My family felt comforted too when I told them. So we began our descent and started swimming around the shipwreck. 
We crossed our old instructor twice, but every time I signed to him that everything was okay. It was at that moment that I saw Marvin swimming towards me. At this moment, I was about five to 10 meters from the down point, still staying under my decompression stop level though. I was a little surprised and even more surprised when he signed me again that he was out of air. I was mistrustful, but if there was any chance that it would be true, I couldn't not help him. So I handed him my spare breather. This time, I had a lot more air left, so it wasn't a problem. He took them, started breathing in it, and took my arm. I reached to see his air level instruments, but he prevented me from seeing it. Then, he signed me to start an ascent with him. I immediately signed no. I wasn't at my deepest when he reached me, but I'd been deeper during this time and I had a decompression stop to go. I saw that my father saw us, but he quickly looked away, probably not understanding what was going on. I tapped at my diving computer, a device which calculates when and how long to decompress. To signify to him, he shrugged, smiled at me and started swimming up, still holding me. I was paralyzed for a few seconds and the thing that helped me react was that my diving computer was telling me to stop and decompress now. I then understood that I was in danger, that if I let him do what he wanted, I would die from the bends. I then started screaming, only to remember that no noise can be heard underwater. I started wriggling frantically as I saw my father and sisters way below me, my diving computer alerting me more and more intensely. At that moment, my father saw us and he reacted. He swam very quickly towards us and I managed to hit the guy as my dad grabbed my ankle and suddenly dragged me deeper. The guy then quickly swam away. My dad dragged me deeper again and then we waited for a very long decompression stop to ensure that I would be okay. Then started heading towards the surface very slowly and cautiously. On the surface, I started crying frantically and went back to the boat. My father told me he thought Marvin was my old instructor, and this is why he wasn't surprised at first. I then told my old instructor, who took it more seriously this time, and told me to show him who Marvin was when he was up on the surface. The thing is, he never did. Marvin was nowhere to be seen. The next day on New Year, we went a last time to the scuba diving club because my little sister had a diploma to collect, and we saw Charlie. Still choked, I told her what happened with Marvin. And then she stiffened. She told me that Marvin was at the restaurant yesterday on New Year's Eve, and he didn't go scuba diving, which means that this guy wasn't Marvin. And to this day, I still don't know who he was, and what he wanted, and why he tried to kill me, maybe twice. I was waiting for an Uber, but couldn't find the car, so the driver called me, we talked for a bit, and agreed on a new meeting spot around the block. I asked him what the car number was, just to confirm, but the call got interrupted immediately, so I thought he didn't hear me and hung up. Anyway, I went where we were supposed to meet, and a few moments later, I got in the car, which I recognised from the number plates on the application. He seemed very confused and was on the phone with someone. He said a few words and hung up the call. I thought Uber must have messed up and connected him to a different person, but he insisted that he was talking to me about where to meet. I was sure it wasn't me though. This weirded us both out. We tried to go through the conversation and align on what we discussed. He said I asked him what the number plates are and he continued talking to me until we met. When we got to the destination, we checked the calls, and my phone call lasted 1 minute 17 seconds, and his call lasted for 3 minutes, made at exactly the same time. But I got off the phone, yet he somehow kept talking to me. He hung up when I got in, so we don't know what the hell would have happened if that conversation was going to continue, but it really freaked us both out. What the hell happened? Who was the person who he talked to? How can this even happen? Do you think it was a joke? He just seemed as scared as me about the whole situation.
So I've been sitting on this story for three years, telling some close friends who respond with astonished looks and advice on mental health, and they think I'm completely insane. It's 11.17 in rural New Brunswick, Canada, and I'm getting in my car to head back to Fredericton from my parents' place in the middle of nowhere. I had just finished up a small gig at a local fair, having had one or two beers at the show. So I'm just pulling out of my parents' driveway onto a dim country road going back to the city when I turn on my high beams to see a tall, lanky, completely black figure standing in the ditch on the right side of the road. I mean, this thing must have been eight or nine feet tall. It looked as if it had absorbed all the light and had really small limbs. As soon as I saw it, it started to run up the ditch and across the road in a very fast, very strange, gliding kind of way. I slammed on the brakes and watched this thing run across the road and into a field on the other side of the road towards some woods. I'm getting goosebumps writing this, but I could still see its silhouette speeding across the field in my neighbour's yard lights as it went into the black of the night. I stopped to shiver on the road for a moment before speeding up the road to a safer distance. I had no idea what I just saw, so I called my mum to tell her I had just seen this tall, alien-looking creature less than 100 metres from their home. She and my sister searched online with what I had told them and came back with an article on the black stick man phenomena, which exactly fit what I saw on this normal August night in New Brunswick. This experience has really opened my mind to the paranormal, So for that, I'm really thankful. I was looking over my shoulder for weeks, afraid to go out at night, and I still feel unnerved thinking about it. I haven't seen anything like it since, and I hope I never do. When I was 10, I had an encounter that I have never been able to explain. I was wandering through the backwoods on St. Patrick's Day. By that point, I was well aware that leprechauns were not real, so I wasn't really looking for anything so much as just killing some time. No neighbours behind our house, no anything, just woods. I knew the woods really well and was extremely comfortable spending days wandering around. At one point, I stopped walking for a bit and was just looking around when I heard some sticks break. I looked over, fully thinking I was about to see a deer, when all of a sudden, out walks a seven-foot-tall leprechaun with orange hair. No mask on or anything like that, just a huge dude dressed as a leprechaun in the middle of the woods with orange hair and a beard. He didn't see me and I totally froze. He wasn't wearing a mask. I saw him blink and his features move and change when he grinned. The face had a strange waxy sheen to it. All the features were mostly normal except for the mouth. His mouth was too long and when he grinned, it seemed to get even bigger. He was a big guy and also I didn't have any neighbours or anybody that would have been around the area. I live in the woods of Maine. Why anybody would be wandering around in the middle of nowhere dressed that way is beyond me. I watched him walk for maybe 10 to 15 seconds. The only thing I can remember thinking is, I can't do anything. I was frozen to the spot, but somehow I managed to yell out, Hey, you! The guy stopped in his tracks and turned his head and looked at me and sort of grinned. I lost all courage at that point and turned around and ran faster than I ever have in my life. I have no clue if he gave chase or not, but in my mind it felt like he was right behind me and I never slowed down or looked back. This experience has driven me nuts ever since it happened because I just don't know how to explain it. Nobody knew where I was going, so it couldn't have been a setup. I've asked my parents 
and they both say they didn't have anything to do with it and that I'd just made it up as a kid. Thinking about it as an adult, my best guess is that I saw something that day and my brain just wasn't able to process it and my mind turned it into something that I could understand and since it was St Paddy's Day, I ended up seeing a leprechaun. I honestly have no idea though and it has stuck with me for years. I've never seen anything paranormal or whatever you want to call it since. Also, I've always hated the fact that in a world where people see ghosts, UFOs and Bigfoot, I had to see the most ridiculous thing possible. I figured I could throw this out there and see if anyone else has any explanations or similar experiences. Well, pumpkins, that's all we have time for tonight. I'm off to slip into something a little more glam to welcome my guests this evening. Have a lovely Halloween, and I will see you all next time. Au revoir! <laughs>